Next thing I'm going to share is my screen to show you just a few things in terms of tools. Um, and I'm going to do that right now. So there are a couple things that are important to know for the tools we're using. Again, I need to move this. For me, that's probably in the way. Uh, first of all, we've already talked about muting, and muting is the uh, microphone icon here. If you're really, uh, if you really like com computer keyboards rather than mouses, and if you're using a computer, you can press Control and then D, and that will mute you and unmute you. So that's your toggle. If you like to use keystrokes rather than your mouse, you can do that. Um, that only works on, uh, well, it'd be Command D for uh, for Wayne. I know he's he's on a Mac. So maybe some of you else also you are too. So Control D is a mute. So um, I want to show you, we were talking earlier about the change layout. Now, you won't see the recording because only I can I can start a recording, but change layout allows you to change it to that tiled format or down the side with the main speaker talking. Um, so there's a couple different layouts there. You can play with them. But when I'm presenting, I'm going to guess like if you try to do it now, it's it'll probably say someone's presenting and it's not going to give you any options. Um, this information under here is very similar to what you've received in the in, on the email or by the text message. It shows you the meeting information, but it also shows you the dial-in options. So if for some reason your microphone is just acting up or your speakers aren't doing well, you always have the option of seeing the visuals, but then dialing in. And there's a number there that it is long distance. So if you have to pay for long distance, I wouldn't recommend that. But if you uh, dial in, you have to put in this pin number here uh, when you're prompted to, which includes the pound sign there, at last symbol. Um, that's another way to get some audio uh, working for you. There's another feature that you might be uh, accessing right after I tell you about it because it's very helpful and usually pretty accurate. It's this one right here. It says, turn on captions. Uh, when it when you when you have it toggled, it turns green. Now this is probably mainly for uh, tablet and computer users, but you can turn on captions to see the words that I'm saying crossing the bottom of the screen. That's helpful for just for me. I've always used captions, and I think it helped our kids learn how to read quite quickly. Um, so captions have always been helpful for for me, and if they help you to be able to follow along with the class, especially on the computers or the tablets, then you can turn on the captions. I, I'm i not aware, and we don't have to work on that right now. We can talk about it offline if the phones uh, have that button in the same spot. There's one feature that I may use, but I'm, I'm considering whether it's gonna be helpful or not. Um, and I would suggest there are ways that we could use this, but up in the top, uh, you know, right corner, there's a chat box. This allows us to send messages or to answer questions or to say you have a question. So um, this would this would come up on my computer kind of like it's going to do right now. Um, it should pop up a little, little thing on the bottom of your screen that says, I have a question. Um, I don't know what that looks like on a phone. I should have kept my phone open and on so I could have seen that. Uh, so I'm going to have to do a little more research about how the phones work when you're when you're using the video on your phone. Um, so chat's not gonna help the people who are who are just in on, on the phone tonight. I'm, I'm using the presenter uh, version of this. So it says you are the present, you are presenting. Um, sometimes like, see now I can say it. Now Rick, Rick had to leave the meeting, but if, when Rick comes into the meeting, for some reason his phone always takes over, says it wants to present. So I don't know exactly why that's happening on his, uh, but you, for the most part, please don't press the you are presenting a button. Um, and then finally, if you want to ask a question, just please come in off your mic and say, Pastor, could could I ask you something? And of course, I, I want you to be able to do that anytime uh, you have a question. I may not always be able to answer it, like I said. Okay. I'm going to stop presenting now. So that should return us to something that looks more like um, the gallery for the moment. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to switch to a different screen. Now see, you saw Rick come in. Um, and that's, that's what happens usually.
So hopefully Rick doesn't take back over, but um, you may recognize, at least some people from the church may recognize this because I use Prezi as a part of my uh, sermons and maybe people haven't missed it at all. You know, we haven't had to do that in a while, right? I'm a very visual person. I love visuals and I think they can help in education quite a bit. Um, and so what I'm going to be using tonight is a way of actually sharing, um, my, my visual, my face, but also be able to share a presentation with you. And so really as a part of our introductions, the last thing I wanted to do was to talk about some of the basics, you know, why is a, why is a letter written by Paul to a church, you know, the church that's meeting in Colossae. And I'm wondering, it all depends on your personality. Um, have you recently felt like writing a strongly word letter? You know, is that one of those times where you just say enough's enough and you, you get out pen and paper or you start typing up an email, right? And, and that, that oftentimes is a response that we have to circumstances in our life. And I wonder what the occasion was for you. So consider that as you also remember, oftentimes that's why a lot of the letters of the scripture were written. You know, letters that were written with an occasion so were sometimes written because of the, the deep feeling, the deep uh, either help or hurt that the, uh, the, the writer was feeling uh, for the people who are receiving that letter. So tonight, as we start to dig into Colossians, we are entering into a letter that uh, has an occasion, has a reason for being written but was intended by the Holy Spirit to be received by us to strengthen our faith as well. And so um, tonight we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, Colossae, the, the, the town that uh, the Colossians uh, was written to. And, and for that really to be um, a part of our, our picture right now, I need to uh, share a little bit uh, another screen with you. And that one is, real quickly, just to show you, um, you know, the one powerful thing about our holy scriptures is that they are grounded in history. And this history has a place. It has a location. And very potentially, uh, I know at least Wayne has been to Turkey. I don't know if any of you other, any of the other of you have been. Um, I'm going to guess that Colossi was not on your tour. Maybe it was. It's not very popular to go to it's very much inland as you can see this is not a town any longer um but you can see where it is in turkey right um and if we zoom way in it's this is just uh, pretty much a, a natural area now with a couple of archaeological sites that can be visited um when i say archaeological site i mean more of a tourism site uh, Colossi has not really been uh, a place where archaeology has happened. I'll tell you about some of the things that have been discovered, but this, uh, this uh, location that we just saw is just telling us a little bit about where, um, where it is we're going to be, this letter is going to be written to. So now I want to share again my, my presentation. I'm going to swap back to that and show you some of that uh, modern day. Uh, I mean, this is more of a biblical map after I showed you the modern day one. This one highlights all of the different towns that are uh, addressed in the seven letters of Revelation. As you can see, it points out Patmos. But it was a perfect one for me to point out these, these three cities, this tri-city of Heropolis and Laodicea and Colossae, because these are, are gonna specifically be mentioned um, as part of uh, the area where this letter is going to, um, I'm going to get more get more to that. This this is a this is from a tourism guide. So in some ways, this is kind of a little bit of a fanciful picture of Colossae. It gets about right in terms of size. You can kind of get a sense for the size of Colossae. Um, it has it makes some guesswork about where the different districts are. And if you can't see that part, don't worry about it. It really is just kind of meant to give you. A sense of size and i would say uh if you are kind of picturing uh for those of you who live out here in staten if you're kind of picturing that um you're not too far off 
you know, a little small town um, and uh, surrounded uh, by hills. There's about three streams that come together in this location. I made it a good location to have a town. And, and so the people here would have known uh, a pretty rural life. There's been a lot of debate, a debate why Colossae was called Colossae. Um, some archaeologists falsely attributed it to the Colossus and some help they did with the Colossus at Rhodes. It didn't have anything to do with that. The best guess that they have is that it was named after one of its main uh, items that it produced. Uh, the Colossinus was a dyed wool that was produced in this area. area. And so potentially something it became famous for became the name of the town. Um, so imagine then that this, this area with these sheep all around this small town, uh, which has a pretty reputable um, gymnasium and bath. Um, one of the few archeological finds has been all the donors that helped to build and, and rebuild and expand this bath that had all the names of the donors that that's been found um, in some of the small archeological digs that have been done there. The wool industry was its main industry. And um, if you were to talk to Roger Bothern, who raises sheep, and maybe if you talk to Robin Hummelbaugh right there, um, you, you'd probably find out that selling wool is not really all that um, uh, lucrative anymore. It's not, it's not a main business for, for anybody, uh, for the most part. Um, so times have changed, but Colossae was a very rich industrial area because of that uh, production they were making. There is one uh, person who came from Col uh, Colossae that uh, really is um, uh, a name that you probably recognize as well, and his name is Philemon. Now, Philemon has its own book, and this was a slave owner of Onesimus, and there's an occasion where Paul is going to write a letter to Philemon about Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, whose life was in jeopardy if he were to be discovered. And so... There's a, a beautiful gift in that letter of, of gifting back a brother in Christ to another brother in Christ uh, by Paul. It's a, it's a worthy read. I'm going to I'm going to give you some challenges at the end of our time together for um, what what you can read outside of class. But we're going to we're going to be talking about uh, just the writing of that letter uh, as we go forward. Philemon has a possible history after the writing of Philemon. And, the, and it could be possible that uh, he became uh, the second bishop of the church there in Colossae. But it's a tradition, and it's not very well substantiated. So we're not sure that actually happened. One other point I want to bring out is that near the time of the writing of this letter, there's going to be a major catastrophe in Colossae, and that's an earthquake. An earthquake that, that damaged severely the town. In fact, um, there's been a debate about whether it was ever rebuilt um, there's there's reasons to believe yes or no or to some extent or that everybody a good portion of the population left. Uh, so this is right at the cusp of a major catastrophe in that area. So I'd like to keep that in mind as the hearers of this would have had this letter from Paul in their ears and their hearts and their minds uh, at a time of a great catastrophe. Now, uh, my mom knows I like to play with words. I love words. I love definitions. I like to sometimes use uh, kind of uh, uh, jokes about words that sound the same as others. And so I did think of this letter as a good study for us. It's only four chapters. We're using a new tool. And I thought this would be a good way to start trying to do an interactive study. Um, with that in mind, with these four chapters in mind, um, I thought a letter that Paul wrote while he was imprisoned would be even better because it's kind of a letter from Corinth. So my my uh, play on words was that this, this letter was penned up when uh, Paul was pent up, right? He was stuck away, most likely in Rome, and had this opportunity to write this letter uh, to the people, the, the believers in Colossae. So I want to give you a little bit about the uh, circumstances there. Uh, before I dig into Colossians, if we can get into that, we're just about out of time. And I do like to keep close to about an hour. I know that even just our sitting uh, doesn't allow us for a certain amount of time to, to hear. Um, you can stand up and you're, 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 you have no problem with you moving around uh, while the class is going on. I can't really do that so much, but 
So uh, in, as introduction to the occasion of this letter, I want to talk about uh, just the circumstances around that. First of all, the church in Colossae was probably founded around 56 and 57. This is when Paul was in Ephesus. He actually had never been to Colossae. Epaphras, one of the people working under Paul as a missionary, a missionary in training, went to these three towns, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae, and is most likely the missionary founder of these towns. So this is where Paul is connecting with this uh, town and the circumstances of this letter, because there is a connection between him and Ep Epaphras and then Colossians. And Paul is coming back to a connection to that town after he has gone to trial, after he's been in Caesarea, after he's been transported to Rome, and now he's in Rome in, in under arrest. Uh, the circumstances of arrest is a bit of a debate, and even where he wrote Colossians is a debate. And I have to always choose what materials to share with you. So in this case, I'm saying this letter was written while Paul was a prisoner in Rome. Um, it could be, it could have been Caesarea a couple of years earlier. It could have been in Ephesus. He t he's, he's been in prison many times because of preaching the gospel. And so there are other, other opportunities, but none that he specifically substantiated. So the okay. writing of this letter is said to be in when, when he's in, under arrest in Rome, which probably was about 60 and 61. And the earthquake in Colossae is very early in the 60s. So it's very close, close to this time. Um, apparently in his circumstances of arrest, uh, Paul is able to receive visitors. He's able to talk to people. He's able to write letters. He's able to hear the circumstances of the church. And he hears from Epaphras, potentially in person, right? As we'll hear in the letter, that there's trouble. Um, the, the circumstances I'm going to unpack as our last kind of topic. But when the, he writes this letter, he sends this on. And it's at the end of the letter. He sends this with a person named Tychicus. And Tychicus, he, he had Colossians most likely in his hand, the letter to the Colossians, the letter to the Ephesians, and Philemon. And he might have had other letters in his hand too, but if you could imagine being Tychicus, can you imagine having those letters, this bundle, he's like the mail person, right? And he's bringing back these letters. Can you imagine the responsibility? Can You, you couldn't even know really the timelessness of your task as you were carrying the word of God along with you, right? This way that God is going to prepare his people going forward. And Tychicus was that person who got to share those letters with God's people. It's hard to imagine, but it's also fun to think of uh, Tychicus with this, you know, uh, arm full of scrolls and, uh, and that they would become part of our holy scriptures. So what Paul is hearing from Epaphras is that the trouble in Colossians is this new teaching. Uh, this town of Colossae has had a few people come in to share a new teaching. And I want to give you some of the highlights of this. And if you, have, or if you are taking notes, this would be a good time to write these down and say, I'm going to listen for those as I read through Colossians. Because you'll hear Paul along the way. Um, so here's some of just the things that, that are being taught right now that has caused uh, Epaphras the concern that he's speaking to uh, uh, Paul about. The first is that the spiritual, the spirit, the non-matter part of our universe is the only good thing that exists. This is the teaching that's being taught, that spirit is good. But on the other side of that, matter is the worst thing. If the spirit is the best, matter is the worst. And if you're going to talk about the most highest form of, of spiritual creatures, you would call that the fullness, all right? And you're going to hear Paul use fullness, so watch for that, because he's contradicting directly what he, they're being taught. The fullness, or the pleroma, which was the word in, in Greek, was their highest spiritual being, all right? And from that spiritual being, then all these lesser spiritual beings came from they're called emanations. And you're going to hear some of these terms come up uh, in Colossians 2. Emanations were called aeons, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. Probably heard some of those, haven't you? Some of those are used for angels and are certainly connections that we have in proper theology 
to spiritual beings. But what they're hearing from these new teachers is that each one of these people represents some kind of power in the universe. And if you know the special knowledge about each one of those, you can gain power with them. So aeons, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, they come down from the play Roma, right? And um, the farther you get away from the play Roma, the closer you get to matter. In fact, there's, there's one last uh, emanation I want to talk about, um, and that's the Demiurge is what it's called. Uh, very far away from uh, the play Roma. In fact, this uh, Demiurge decided to, to sin against the play Roma by, by making matter right? So you hear already the worldview of what matter is like, because it was a sinful, rebellious activity in creating matter. I hope you're hearing like major red flag. Wait, that, that, that doesn't sound anything like our theology. You're right. You're right. Um, later on, this is developed Gnosticism. It's developed by a person named Marcion, which was one of the major heretics of the early church, uh, because the person that the Demiurge is connected with is Yahweh because Yahweh creates all things in, in terms of matter, according to them, and matter is evil and it's a sin and rebellion that makes uh, matter come into play. And all these things should sound like, oh my goodness. Well, it only gets worse because now a flesh person, a person that was matter from the start, named Jesus, actually escapes matter and becomes pure spirit. That Jesus re was redeemed by another force and then redeemed others. So all those things I just talked about are things that Paul is wrestling with. This is what he's hearing from Epaphras. This is what these false teachers are teaching. And as you're reading through Colossians, listen for how Paul directly contradicts that kind of teaching. It may sound strange to you, but the upshot is, is that they're teaching that Jesus is not God that Jesus needed saving first, that he was just matter that needed help, that all matter is evil. And within that same context, especially with Marcion as he developed this, the Old Testament is just completely thrown out. So what you're going to hear is the opposite of that, is that Jesus is God, Jesus is in control, that he is a sinless being, and that as God made man, he redeems the world. He doesn't need redeeming. And another thing about our theology that's important to keep track of, we will be talking about this as we go through Colossians. We'll unpack this quite a bit more. Is that matter is made good. It's made by God and it's a great gift. It's something to steward, to take care of, and to give thanks to God for. So really the, the, the book is going to start to unpack a lot of that. And so as your first challenge this week, it's only four chapters, like I mentioned. And maybe you've already done this, so now read it again in another translation. But the challenge for this week is that I'm going to ask you to read through uh, Colossians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'm going to have as reference, I want to just, I want to check in with everybody real quickly. Because um, I would suspect on tablets and on computers, this is probably pretty readable. But now I'm going to ask for any of you who are using visuals tonight. Is there any of you that just can't read this? You can pop, you can bring come off of a mute to let me know. We can go on to uh, okay. okay. I'm glad to hear that. This allows me to reference directly verses in the chapter right away, but I would ask you to always have your Bible with you. Uh, I'm going to be using the New Living Translation for the study and the um the translation I'm reading from, though, that I like to use is a God's Word translation. It's one of my favorites. Um, if you are looking for another Bible to read, that you want to hear another translation with uh, a unique take on that, uh, the God's Word uh, translation is one of my favorites. And um, so uh, that's another opportunity to read a different translation. So uh, we're going to close in prayer. And we're going to gather right back together again here. I'm surprised it's only 8.04. Thank you for your patience. You, you've given me the gift of five more minutes. I very much appreciate that. Um, before we close, just any any final questions that will I will most likely write down to answer next time? John? I heard, John? I think I heard my mom. Her mother, yes. 
<laughs> I want you to know, because uh, Bonnie is probably too modest to tell you, but Bonnie and Randy spent, oh, I don't know, 15 years as missionaries in Turkey. Oh. So, therefore, she may have visited Colossae. I don't know. And she knows a lot about that area. So, just wanted well, you I to know that. that. Bonnie, you're going to be uh, you're going to be tapped for some questions then along the way, and uh, and I know uh, uh, on my pictures right next to you is is Wayne and Janet, and they had a chance to visit Turkey as well. So I hope uh, hope my mom hasn't let the cat out of the bag there, and I look forward to hearing more about that. Did you get a chance to visit Colossae though? That'd be a really unusual spot. No, we did not go to Colossae. We visited many of the other cities, but never went went there. Yeah, I would. If if I had my choice of places to visit, I don't think that would be high on my list. But I'm going to show you how incredibly wonderful this book is. I hope. I hope. I hope you're in love with Colossians by the time we get to chapter four. If not, um, you've definitely heard something worth listening to in the Word of God for sure. Any other any any questions? Before we close, a lot of introductory information, just giving you some basic landscape, uh, getting the picture of where Colossae is in your mind, to think about a little bit about what that area would have looked like. If you just drive around the hills around uh, Staten and see uh, the, the sheep flocks, it's not too hard. Well, with that, um, I'm going to close our time in prayer. I want to mention I did meet with Robin uh, earlier, earlier, and um, I discovered because of Robin, and she helped me, I'm sure this is exactly why she wanted to do that, is that even though I leave the room, the room is going to stay open. <laughs> so Robin on her phone had our, our room set up, and it was, it's been on for a couple hours, right, since we met. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. So um, you do have to leave the room. Uh, it won't. It won't close it for you. Um, and if you um, if you remember that that is a um, that just looks like the old style phone there in the bottom of the screen. Uh, it it this is the one that's always going to have a little bit of red on it, and it says leave call if your mouse is hovering over it. Um, it should look very similar on a phone. And uh, so after we get done with our prayer time, uh, make sure to hang up the phone. Otherwise, otherwise, I'll see you back here next week and you'll be the first one here. <laughs> anyway, all right. So I have a meeting with my mother right after this one. So I better not be late. Heavenly Father. We thank you for the gift of this time. This is an amazing way to get together. It's not as good as being next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. So Lord, we um, we take uh, this moment to give thanks that tonight we were able to meet. We were able to share with each other a little, a little bit of our snippet of our journey. And now as we journey into Colossians, Lord, I just give you thanks for the many gifts that Paul has in store for us, that your Holy Spirit uh, wanted to share across time. So thank you for the servants like Epaphras who started that church, who was watching over the church and seeing trouble. Thank you for Paul and his writing of this letter. Thank you for people like Tychicus who even carried the letter to uh, make it part of our, the gift we have in the Holy Scripture. And so guide our reading this week, our meditations on Colossians um, as, we, uh, as we dig into the text and receive this gift. Uh, we return thanks to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, with that said, I'm going to send you uh, on your way and in, in the peace of the Lord as you're reading through Colossians. Uh, if, unless you're not that kind of person, if you have a question, write write a put a little question mark right on the side of the column of your Bible. If you don't want to do that, put a piece of paper in your Bible and say, "I'd sure like to ask Pastor about that. That's a strange thing." And then uh, and then make a note to bring it for the good of everybody in the next class. So we we'll go in peace. God's blessings to all of you. Yeah. Wonderful to see you tonight. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Yeah.